We are honored this morning to have uh, Dr. Teresa Everson on with us. She is the health officer here in Yakima, and she is on the phone with us this morning. Good morning, Dr. Teresa Everson. Good morning, Lance. How are you doing this morning? Very well. My colleague uh, Dave Edel with us as well. And Good morning, Doctor. Hi, Dave. Hello. Well, what, you know, we, we've got so many questions for you. Thank you so much uh, for spending some time with us. I, I guess, first of all, what is going on in Yakima? Why, uh, why are we seeing such a high rate of cases? What do you think is the cause of that? Yeah, that's that's the million dollar question right yeah. now. So uh, I'm going to give you a positive and a negative. I always like to give positives first. One of the big reasons why we're seeing so many cases in Yakima is that we're doing a really good job of testing. Uh, we're able to see uh, how other counties in the state are doing testing-wise as far as per, you know, per thousand people in our county, how many tests are we doing. Uh, and as of uh, this weekend, we were number one in the state for how many tests we're able to do for our residents. So we're doing a really great job with testing, which means we're finding cases a little better than, than some are. Um, but the but the not positive or the, the negative is I do think we have some increased local transmission here compared to other counties, and there, there are some good reasons for that. Uh, the first is we have a lot of essential workforce in our county. We have a lot of agriculture. We've got a lot of warehouses. We've got manufacturing. We have a lot of people that, that can't stay home right now because the work that they do is so critical, not just for our state, state but for the nation. Um, so those folks can't stay home. Uh, they have to go out. They have to be out and about and working with, with uh, coworkers. So um, because we can't stay at home as well, I think we do see more more transmission. And just to give you a number, uh, about 63% of our local workforce is considered to be uh, essential. Um, we have the ability to see how much less people have been out and about in their cars since all of this began. And compared to some of the counties where people tend to have more, more desk jobs and can stay at home and do their work at home, uh, they might have reduced their driving by between 45 and 50 percent. But in Yakima, we've only decreased our driving to, to work by about 30 percent. So we've got some objective data that shows us that we, we just can't stay home as much because of work. Eh, go ahead, Dave. No, I was going to say that, uh, that the, you know, the, I think what's, what frustrates people is um, this idea of proportionality. You know that we have the most cases, but people some some people listening in stop hearing it at that point. Like they get more cases in Yakima, but the truth is, uh, it's it's based on our population. There was a time when all they wanted to test was people who had symptoms. Uh, so you're telling us that people have been continuing to be tested. Uh, if I wanted to get tested today, could I go someplace and get tested? Yeah, yeah, you absolutely could. So there's a, there's kind of two pieces to that, uh, and ultimately the answer is just going to be yes. Anybody who who feels like getting a test, symptoms or no, can go get one. Um, we've been ramping up our testing based on testing availability, and we're doing pretty good right now. Um, but right now, the the reasons to get tested are symptoms, and really, really the list is wide of what counts as symptoms for this. It used to just be fever and shortness of breath and cough. But now it's opened up to things like body aches and headache and sore throat. And I'll tell you, we've seen a lot of people who thought that they were having allergies uh, who weren't just having allergy problems. They were actually having mild coronavirus symptoms. So if you've got symptoms, yeah, you can, you can contact your personal physician uh, and get a test right now. The folks who we're testing who are asymptomatic or don't have any symptoms right now uh, are people who we know have been in contact with somebody with COVID because we're trying to figure out who may have picked up the virus but isn't actually uh, showing any symptoms yet uh, but may still be sharing those, uh, those germs with other folks. Uh, and then the other asymptomatic folks we're testing are people in our long-term care facilities because we're trying to, to stay on top of those outbreaks as best we can. Well, that all, that all makes sense, but I, I don't know how that adds up to we're doing more testing than anybody else uh, unless we've got more people showing more symptoms and we've got more people in nursing homes. You see what I'm saying? The, uh, the, the, the widespread Joe Average testing thing really isn't happening yet. And yet our numbers are based on the fact that we've done so many tests. So the only way we could get to so many tests under that scenario is so many people showing symptoms. Is that fair to say? Yeah, well, I think it's a combination of factors. I think we do have more folks uh, showing symptoms than showing up. But I, uh, our health district and our emergency operations center have been really working overtime for the past two months to try to get our hands on as many test kits as possible to be then getting out to our hospitals and to our clinics to do that testing. So we've been really working on test kit availability as hard as we can. Things are really, really tough, or they've been tough for the past couple of months. We're trying to make sure that we have as many as possible, and that's just getting better better every day. 
Is there any off-the-shelf kind of things that uh, provide any sort of uh, uh, help in that regard? Anything that exists right uh, now? As far as testing? Yeah. Oh, so that's a that's a great question. Could we be, you know, putting something together ourselves or, or sourcing this some other way? Uh, the tricky part is the, the tests, one, have to be compatible with the labs uh, that are having to run the tests. So there's really specific kinds of swabs that have to be used yeah. um, to, to gather these samples. Uh, and they also have to be approved <laughs> um, at the federal level to be run. Uh, and part of that is we need to make sure that it's actually a good test. Um, you can stick, you know, a, a Q-tip in your nose and try to send it to a lab, but what they really need to know is when you get that sample and they put it in the machine to run it, how good are the results? Um, will a cotton swab in your nose be able to tell you if you've got coronavirus or not? You know, it's not. It won't tell you. Um, so we know how good any given test is on a specific swab, on a specific machine. So there's a lot that goes into that. Hmm. Uh, KIT News Time is 721. Uh, talking to Dr. Teresa Everson, the health officer for the Yakima Health District. Uh, you know, I think you've got a lot of people listening that are very frustrated right now, Dr. Um, and, and, and as you've seen, you know, in Yakima and around the country, people are, are pretty fed up with with the lockdown. And I, I guess if you could talk to those people, what do you have to say to them? What, well, uh, it, it, when will life reopen for them? Um, uh, and, and do you have anything, I, I guess, that, that, could, that could ease their concerns? Yeah. So I guess the first thing that I want to say is, is thank you. I can't imagine a, a worse situation to be in than to not really understand why life is so hard and to be having to to follow rules that you're not really trusting in to begin with. So I just want to say thank you to, to Yakima County for doing what it has so far to keep our counts where they are. And I heard you kind of give those those morning numbers uh, already. I'll tell you, when we, were, when we were in March and trying to project ahead to what this would look like, we really thought that our hospitals were going to be completely overwhelmed by the right. first or second week of April. Um, we were talking about setting up an extra hospital to be able to care for all of our coronavirus patients, to be caring for um, patients who have all kinds of other needs. You know, people who have had heart attacks and strokes and um, really bad injuries. And, you know, we, we have not needed that extra hospital because of what we've been able to do in, in Yakima County. Our, our death rate, while every one of those deaths hits us hard, um, we could have been seeing much higher numbers. We could have been seeing much higher hospitalizations. So I just I want to say thank you to folks for doing what they have so far to be staying at home when they can, to be wearing those masks, to be keeping their hands clean, and to be to be doing their part to try to stop this transmission. So that's the first thing is, is a big thank you. And as far as when are we going to reopen, you know, that's that's the thing we've been working on for, uh, when I want to say at least the past month here in the state, is trying to figure out how quickly can we do that safely, uh, in what order should we be doing things, um, and there's a lot of information that has been uh, coming out, not just from the CDC, but specifically from the governor's office about what, what plan makes sense for us in Washington. And we're already starting, starting to see some of those baby steps. Um, they've gotten uh, pretty granular as far as what, what should we be waiting for before we can feel comfortable about opening in any specific county. Uh, and you probably heard about all of those metrics. It's things like making sure that we have enough tests for anybody who needs one, making sure that we have all of the protective equipment we need. And that doesn't just mean for, for the healthcare community. So, of course, they need their gowns and their, their masks and their gloves and their face shields, but making sure that people who need to go to work can do that in a safe way. So if you need to wear your mask at work, that you have a mask, that if you need hand sanitizer at work, that that's available. Um, we also need to make sure that our healthcare system is in a good place uh, to be opening up. And we, we have been doing well enough in Yakima County that we have not needed that additional hospital. Um, but I'll say things have, have been fairly tight uh, in a couple of our hospitals as far as ICU capacity or intensive care unit capacity. Mm. So we're watching those numbers all the time uh, to see if we're doing okay. Um, and things are tight, but we're doing okay. So that kind of brings me back to my big thank you to Yakima County for keeping our, our health care system from getting overwhelmed. Uh, and then what we've been hearing about a lot over the past uh, week or so is contact tracing abilities, which means every time we get a positive case, uh, how well are we able to be in communication with that person to make sure that they're doing okay, um, that they're able to stay home, that, they, that they're that they not in a critical situation where they feel like they're forced to work um, either by their employer or because um, their, their family finances mandate it. So what can we do to be supporting that individual? And then from there, um, figuring out who they've had to be in contact with, uh, uh, 
during the time they were infectious and reaching out to those folks to make sure that they're okay, uh, to make sure that they're yeah. tested, to make sure that they don't need support. Um, so those are just some of the things that we're, that we're we, working but, on. But we have to do those yeah. things before we reopen? You know, the, the, Doc, if I, if I can say that this way, uh, while, yeah. while we wait to make sure we have certain things just in case, there is no question that just in case has arrived and driven deep into the hearts of people who aren't working, <laughs> you know, our huge unemployment numbers and all of that. So to them, it's like, wait a second, we got to make sure that there's enough gloves down the road. And until we have that, I can't work. That isn't working for me. Uh, at what? Yeah. At what point, doctor, do we see the, the 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 realities of the world of medicine intersect with the realities of the world of economy? A lot of people think that you guys, I don't know your position, so I'm just putting this out there in in general. That there's a lot of uh, ivory tower academia involved in 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 numbers and in data crunching, uh, but no feet on the ground. I haven't got any food here. I can't pay my bills, kind of things. And so, how do we make sure that our medical leadership is in tune and making decisions, factoring in uh, the other side of the equation, not just the, uh, the the medical side? How do we do that? Yeah. Well, uh, I'll I'll share something personal, and then I'll I'll kind of expand from there. I was reflecting on that this morning, uh, and I've heard a lot of people really frustrated that it seems like those who are making all the decisions are the people who get to keep their jobs uh, and might might be able to still send their kids into daycare. Um, that we're, we're really not getting it. I, I grew up with a single parent. Uh, we lived paycheck to paycheck, and this, this would have devastated my family. This would have completely dev- devastated my family. So I, I very much understand that. And then there's this question, you know, are we just – are we just in our heads thinking about this? Are we really sure that, that reality is matching what we think is going on? And I guess I would share, you know, we have had to do a lot of, um, I'll say predictive modeling, which means using math to try to figure out what we think is happening and where numbers might be going. Uh, and all those we're doing our best with that predictive modeling uh, based on previous information as far as what did we see with, you know, swine flu in 2009? What did we see with this, the Spanish flu pandemic? And 1918. But then we also have at least three months of very real world information about how this virus behaves and what kinds of things have worked in other places as far as um, needing to restrict movement in the community and social distancing measures. So um, we're, we're kind of using a combination of, um, of science and modeling and um, real world uh, experience with what other countries have, have gone through before us. Um, in Washington state, we, we had to be pioneers in the country to try to figure out what, what works best for American citizens as far as trying to keep on top of this virus. But um, we were not the first of the world, so we've gotten to draw on, on experience of other countries. Well, Sweden is the one that everybody uh, has dangling in front of them now as they didn't lock down, and, and they're no worse off than anybody else. I mean, it's not as though they, they saved everyone, but it, it's almost like, look, coronavirus is going to get so many of us anyway. It's just it is. Uh, our vulnerable populations uh, are going to get it, and they're going to pay the price. So, what other price do we pay? Given that's you know that's a given. So, uh, is, is that like a, a totally faulty way to to view this? Because um, it just no, seems, it's, no, it's not. Yeah, go ahead. Go, go ahead. ahead. I was just going to say it just seems say to me it seems to me that we're going to pay a price for coronavirus, and we can either pay that price alongside with right. working, right. or we can pay that price <laughs> alongside of us watching it happen and then returning to no work. It's almost like there's an inevitability about it. Uh, how far off is that? Well, I, I think that's a really understandable way to be seeing the current situation. We've all we've all been um, trying to stay at home for at least six weeks now. This is it's getting it's getting really rough. Um, I will say that when when everybody uh, a couple of months ago was trying to think about what's it going to take to to get on top of this and to really try to prevent the the healthcare system overwhelmed, to prevent cases, to prevent deaths. Those were all things that we were weighing uh, really heavily. Um, I I would not want to put anybody in in that position of trying to figure out, do we need to tell people to stay at home? Are we going to need to um, tell people that they can't go to work? Um, You know, there's so much that that went into that decision making, not just in our county, but in the state. Um, We know that when when situations like this arise, we don't just see people lose their jobs. We uh, we see kids um, have changes in their educational outcomes. I, our, our 
families uh, are doing their best uh, to teach their kids at home. Our teachers are doing their best to teach their kids at home. But we know that we're going to see some uh, some different outcomes because of this. We know that you know things like domestic violence go up. We know suicide, that yeah, anxiety yeah. goes up. We know that depression goes up. We know that suicide rates go up. There is yeah. so much that we know goes along with this, and these were all part of the the really difficult. Uh, equation uh, way back when we were considering what needed to be done to get on top of this. Well, um, I, I'm glad to hear you say that. Uh, I, I guess the question is, do you have any uh, leeway in terms of pushback against what the governor's office puts out and your health people at the state level based on knowledge of things on the ground here? Yeah, in other words, I guess, would you, if if the governor was to say we're lifting, you know, we're lifting the restrictions, do you Do you anticipate us staying in those restrictions longer because of what's happening here in Yakima? I I hope not. Uh, Those those who know me well know that I tend to be uh, an optimist. I I keep looking at that new May 31st deadline uh, and thinking about how our numbers are. It's really difficult to predict uh, where we're going to be in a month. We've Mm -hmm. been holding fairly steady with our numbers for almost three weeks now. We've been seeing between about 35 to 50 cases per day when you average it out. And we've been holding really steady for a long time. Uh, And I'm trying to think uh, if there are any factors that might uh, help those numbers uh, improve over the next couple of weeks. And I guess I'll I'll highlight a couple of things that we're doing at the health district uh, to hopefully um, push those things along. Of course, we we still request that the public keep doing uh, what they can to to be staying at home and, and doing all of those things to help uh, stop transmission of the virus. But what we're doing at the health district is really pushing hard on providing support to uh, our large employers to make sure that we're not uh, seeing uh, outbreaks or to make sure that we're addressing any outbreaks with our large employers. We, we have been providing uh, education uh, and assistance to pretty much every employer in the county. Uh, and then we're also working really hard to help control our outbreaks in our long-term care facilities. So we know that some of our numbers are, are um, based uh, out of um, – uh, outbreaks in employment settings and outbreaks in long-term care. So we've been working incredibly hard uh, for the past couple of weeks to really focus there. Right. So, but but so so your answer, I guess, is is yes. We will we will have those restrictions in place longer than the governor. Sa- I mean, uh, longer than the governor if he calls a, if he calls for freedom uh, <laughs> on May thirty first. <laughs> we could go into June because of what's happening here in Yakima. Not uh, the opti- well, optimist in me really, <laughs> really hopes not. It, yeah. It's hard to know because honestly, we we need to see uh, improvement in how we're doing. We need to we need to see that uh, when we start relaxing things, that we're not going to have a flare up of cases. Uh, and I don't know how much you guys have kind of dived into that information coming out of the governor's office, but it's it's staged. So there's a plan to. Um, you know, relax yep. these things as far as yep. open up these kinds of businesses and allow this kind of work and maybe allow small gatherings. And they're doing that in stages, which I think is really smart, because uh, if you wait a couple of weeks, two or three weeks between phases and you see a flare up, then you'll kind of be able to tell, OK, what is it uh, that we have a hard time with uh, as far as these activities when we restart them leads to virus transmission. So uh, where it's kind of a scientific way to to try to move forward steadily in a way that doesn't really hurt our county and hurt the system. Well, I, I think, uh, you know, I, I just think there's a lot of frustrated people. And time and time again, the experts have been wrong. The numbers have been off. Um, the models, the, the models have been just, you know, just, uh, 2.2 million. It started out. Now it's down to 134,000. Um, I, 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 I wonder about flu deaths. I mean, it's, 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 you know, huge this year. And I, I guess we're not paying attention to flu deaths and flu sickness because we have a vaccine. Oh, well, uh, flu, if you, uh, if you ever want to participate in one of our Board of Health meetings, it's actually something that I report on every month uh, between September and actually I just gave that report um, at our last Board of Health meeting. Um, so we report on how we're doing flu-wise as far as um, any deaths in the county, how we're doing at the state. And we're out of flu season uh, right now. Part of that, I think, is because of people being able to, to stay at home. So I don't think there's as much flu, um, but we also... Uh, stop testing for flu very widely, uh, at least a month ago. But I do think we're out of flu season, um, if that helps there. One of the things, doctor, that you'll see at the protests is, uh, in addition to people about wanting work, you, you are seeing um, uh, revolutionary war patriots 2.0. You're seeing an awful lot of don't tread on me, stepping on my rights, you know, th- those kind of folks that 
that are you know asking us will be will they force us to take a vaccine will they violate our fourth amendment rights those kinds of uh of of, of things that are really hitting home with a, a percentage of the people um I, I don't think it's the a largest percentage by any means but there is the uh uh tea party memes about going back to work and things like that uh, what about yeah. forced vaccination and, and that sort of thing? Is there anything we can say to put some of those minds to rest in terms of, you know, constitutionality and what our decisions are? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I guess the first thing that I'll say is uh, I, I am very much looking forward to when we have a safe vaccine widely available for folks, because that is the best thing that, that we have to, to get back to uh, whatever our, our new normal is. Um, what we're going for is trying to get as, as much of the population immune to this as possible, and that's going to be one of the best tools we have in our tool belts. Uh, we have not started having conversations around what a mass vaccination program might look like in our state and what kinds of policies are going to be uh, around that. Um, we have uh, exercised at the Yakima Health District around what distributing those kinds of vaccines might might look like. So just know that when it's time, we will be ready uh, for folks who want the vaccine. Uh, but I do know that usually when we have a vaccine uh, that is necessary from a public health standpoint, usually what happens uh, is there is some kind of rule around it where if you choose not to get the vaccine, then you also must choose a different behavior because of that. And the example that I might give is uh, school vaccines. If you choose not to get vaccines for your kid, uh, then there are exclusions that, um, that are paired with that. Uh, so that's what I, that's what I would uh, project. But again, we haven't really had any of those conversations either locally or at the state level, and I'm uh, kind of extrapolating widely. Uh, and I've, I've got a kid I have to get to daycare, so I've got another yep. maybe two or three minutes. One, one last question for that's you, Doctor, then we'll, we'll, have to get to daycare. we'll let you go. Um, sure. The year was 1968. And 571 miles south of Wuhan in Hong Kong, a flu pandemic broke out. And the, the numbers were a million dead worldwide and 100,000 dead in the United States. How, what can you say? There was no shutdown. There was no lockup. There was no anything other than we wrote it out and endured it. And what's different today about uh, a pandemic that's going to claim the same number of lives as that one did, both nationally and internationally, and what's what's taking place? What's different? Why? Oh, so uh, can you give me the numbers again? Yes, according to um, good old Wikipedia, a million okay. deaths worldwide, 100,000 in the U.S. from Hong Kong flu, 1968. Okay. Uh yeah, well, not not um, not being an expert on on that flu and not having information as far as um, how fatal it was or how infectious it was, um, my I would be guessing that what the difference is between that that, that virus and the one that we have now is uh, either the R zero, which is for every person who gets infectious, how many people do they share that infection with? Um, so we may be talking about uh, different infectiousness, and then there also may be a different fatality for this. Uh, the other thing that's a little bit different is how uh, how mobile we are uh, as a nation. Of course, there were plenty of, uh, of plane trips and train rides and boat rides then, but we're even more mobile now than we were before. Um, so restricting movement is, is a different thing in these days than it, than it was then. Sure. Uh, people have a much wider travel base now than they did before. So how quickly that kind of thing uh, gets out and how hard it is to contain is, is very different. So, again, it's hard to, to be really specific because they don't have the, the information about the virus itself in gotcha. 1968. Those would be my thoughts. Well, thank you much for your time yes, uh, and you. sharing your thoughts. Much. I think uh, you said a lot of interesting things. I think our audience appreciates uh, your yes. availability, and we know um, the importance of getting kids to daycare for most of us who <laughs> still have them and, and got to deal with it. So we'll let you run. But, Doctor, thank you for your thank time you. this morning. We appreciate it. Yeah, thanks to you both, and thank you, thank you, Yakima. Keep up the good work.